Well, good morning, everyone. Do I look tan? We spent about, I don't know, five or six days down in Florida. I got, got back last week uh, for Caleb's track meet. We had a good time down there. But I can tell you what, uh, Florida's not really anything that I'm interested in. <laughs> it's hot, busy traffic, uh, but we had a good time. And, and so I know you guys had a, probably uh, just a great time last Sunday listening to Pastor Kyle teach uh, from Faith Christian Fellowship. And so uh, during the course of this past week, I, I watched that, that teaching and, and, uh, and was just kind of thinking through a lot of things uh, that I've been sharing with a couple of the guys on the leadership team here at Calvary Bible Church. And so this morning, I'm going to do something that um, I have never done before. I don't, I don't have any notes. <clears throat> but there's a reason why I don't have any notes, and I have this trusty cell phone. And, and, uh, and so, um, you know, sharing with my wife um, uh, Friday night into uh, some on Saturday, um, and a lot of this, for me, this is just kind of, I'm going to be talking kind of to myself this morning, and hopefully you guys are blessed by whatever God wants to do um, through that. Um, I'm getting to know most of you guys. It, it, we were, me and Jim were talking prior to service. You know, I'll be, be here a year, June 15th, um, but I spoke last May, um, you know, kind of candidating or whatever coming into the church, and, and one of the things I can remember that I spoke about, um, one of the topics was the importance of prayer the importance of prayer. And so through that message I laid out, you know, we looked at uh, Jesus' prayer life and, and how he prayed, how he always took himself aside just to spend time with his heavenly father and, and sometimes all through the night um, that he would do that. And then um, we know the section when uh, his disciples, you know, saw that prayer life and, and they asked Jesus, you know, will you teach us to pray like John's disciples teach him to pray? And we know the Lord's prayer that, that the Lord gave them. Um, to pray, and then we, uh, starting the book of Acts, you kind of see the prayer life of, of all those men, um, starting with the, the picking of Matthias to replace Judas, and, and the, the beginning of the church as they were waiting um, on Pentecost, as the Lord asked them to, uh, they found themselves in one accord in prayer, and, and so I was thinking, uh, you know, I've been thinking uh, this past week coming back from Florida, and I just want to be honest with you guys this morning, and just be transparent with what I believe that the Lord is, is saying to my heart. <clears throat> Uh, Tracy, uh, she's actually downstairs. Well, Tracy, this fr Friday, um, uh, me and her were sitting across uh, you know, the table. We sit in the house, and just the Lord was pouring into me. Just um, really everything happened on Friday for me for some reason. Uh, but uh, prior to that, it's been a course of about three or four years. Um, and, and I can't speak for anybody here. I'm only going to speak for myself. But I've been in this a season for three or four years uh, where um, I'm kind of tired of church. I'm just going to be honest with you this one. I'm just kind of tired of church. Um, and so as I've been sharing with some friends of my pastor friends, leadership, other people, uh, just about this, I, I think if we're honest in the church, um, the reason why our country is falling apart so quickly is because the church is a mess. The church is a mess. <clears throat> and so as I was thinking about um, uh, what Pastor Kyle spoke about um, last Sunday, he uh, was in Acts chapter 19, and, and uh, during Paul's third missionary journey, um, he talked about these three things uh, out of his message that really uh, struck me when, when I watched that, and then I just began to pray last week, uh, through the week, and just things began to happen, and, and, and the Lord began to show up in, in, my, prayer, in my prayer life, um, just speaking to me uh, from... Facebook, I mean, is that crazy? I mean, I'm, hopefully that's one of the ways God speaks to you. We've been looking, or we've been listening to a class that Stephen's been uh, talking uh, about in our learning group after service about the voice. Um, I believe that he can speak through Facebook. I believe that he can speak through Twitter or Twitter or however you say that, tweets. I don't tweet, whatever that is. Um, <clears throat> but I have these friends that are just, they're saying, the sa they've been saying the same thing. Um, I've been challenged. Um, you know, I've had times in the last probably uh, 48 hours uh, of just crying too, just weeping. Because I have never so hear, or clearly, I think, heard um, the Lord speaking to me individually and personally about my relationship with him, um, then, then, you know, how does that then work out um, with you guys? And, and so uh, we're going to look at some things this morning, Second Peter chapter 1. If you're a note taker, I don't have any slides this morning, so Mason gets a break. Um, I don't have anything on the screen. And so um, I just want to share, I believe, what, what the Lord has been showing me uh, really for the last week, but for my life. Uh, the last three upwards, maybe a four years of just a wrestling that I've had in my own soul uh, about what it means to really know uh, Jesus Christ, what it really means to be a disciple of Christ. You know, those things we've been talking about here at Calvary Bible Church now for a while, uh, getting back into biblical discipleship. 
And so, uh, 2 Peter chapter uh, 1, we're going to start there. Uh, if, you do, if you do take notes, we're going to jump into Daniel 9, and then over to Nehemiah chapter 1. We might end up with Col in Colossians chapter 1. And, and you can thank Jim this morning. He sent, me a, um, he sent me one of his devotions on Saturday morning um, as I was kind of sitting in my truck and, and just thinking about some things to watch. And I, and I watched this, and, and when, I look, when I read through Colossians chapter 1, and we'll start there in verse 9, um, it just confirmed everything for me. That indeed God's been talking to me um, powerfully um, Friday into Saturday through the week, but also into my life, just kind of been gently uh, coercing me, gently kind of moving me, you know, in his direction um, so lovingly. Um, and I think it's kind of come to a head for me, for me personally, nothing to do with Calvary Bible. Uh, but um, I'm, like I said, I hope you guys are blessed uh, because it's a personal um, thing that I've been going through uh, just for myself and the Lord. And, and so we're going to look at that. So Second Peter chapter... Um, one. I'm going to start back in verse in, in verse ten. We're going to really look at verse twelve, and then go down through a couple of verses. So, um, for you guys that have been here with us, I see a couple of guests. We have been going through a series called "Rebuilding the Walls," looking at the life of Nehemiah. Um, and uh, so, and we haven't made it very far into the book of Nehemiah, into about the middle of chapter two. And so we've been looking at these things um, in Nehemiah's life that really motivated him to go back into uh, be uh, used by God to rebuild the walls and to rebuild the gates, uh, but ultimately to rebuild the life um, of, of the people of God uh, and the worship of God and the rebuilding of that temple. Um, and so with that, we want to see how, how can we apply those principles? How can we apply those things we see in the life of Nehemiah into our lives here in 2016? And for you guys that are visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. Um, uh, our church has gone through a season of some good stuff. That's all I'm going to, I'm just going to leave it at that, some good things. You know, God has decided um, in his sovereignty uh, that he wants to do something with Calvary Bible Church, and that's what he's been speaking to me uh, uh, Thursday, Friday, all day yesterday. You know, I was just really, um, just, I mean, you can ask Trace, you find her downstairs, she'll, she'll tell you, she thought I was going crazy probably, but um, I was just like, God is speaking so powerfully about this to me. So, 2 Peter 1, starting in 10, says, So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. It says, Do these things, and you will never fail, fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is kind of where I'm, why I'm starting with these verses here in verse 12. It says, therefore, because of this idea of our eternal security, because of this idea of our salvation, because of this idea of you know, our relationship with God as we live for him, Peter goes on and says, therefore, because of all these things, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth, the, the truth that you've been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live, for our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life so I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after um, I am gone. And so what Peter is telling us here is simply the Lord's showing him it's in some way that he's about ready to go to glory, that he's about ready to, the, uh, another version says, you know, put off this tent, that he's going to die. And so the urgency that Peter has is to ensure that those that he's writing to, the Christians, the church that he's writing to, um, is standing firm in the truth that he imparted to them, the truth about the faith of, of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying here is so important that we always remember this. It's so important that we always go back over these things. And, and um, I think I was sharing uh, with Stephen uh, texting over the weekend um, about this series that we've been in, uh, in, in Nehemiah. And so for you guys that are visiting, we kinda look, we're going to look at eight words that I just kind of came up with to start with the letter P, um, you know, where, where Nehemiah there in Nehemiah chapter 1, um, he perceived some things were wrong and kind of drove him to, into some things. But eventually what it did is it, it forced him into prayer. And, you know, I've had times in my life where, where I, God's not spoken to me audibly, like where I could say I actually heard his voice. But this time... On Friday, it was one of those times, and, and I knew I knew it was God's voice because it really, I mean, it just really broke me inside, and he, and, he, and he said, well, that's kind of a neat series, I'm just paraphrasing God, which is, I don't know if that's right, but um, he said, well, that's kind of neat that you're doing a series, but why didn't you spend any time on prayer? Why did he, he basically told me, why did you move so quickly through that prayer? To jump onto your next P word is what, I mean, is that what you're, I mean, that's what he, I mean, and I'm, me, you know, when I pray, I have that, like, I like God to step on my toes. I like God to tell me the truth when I make mistakes and to guide me into the truth that, you know, that he wants me to be in. And so as I begin to think about this, 
And then I begin to think about what Pastor Kyle spoke about um, last uh, Sunday here in Acts chapter 19. And for you guys who were here, if you remember the three things that he brought up uh, that uh, Paul came against there in the city of Ephesus, he said culture, politics, and theology. Culture, politics, and theology. And he said, and those three things are vying to define us. Those three things are, are trying to uh, create in us a worldview of what we believe even about God. And theology, the study of God, uh, he said, is the one that is the most important. He said, but sadly, and I think this is the reason why the church is in a miserable state today, is because I think we become cultural Christians or political Christians instead of biblical Christians. And the reason why Paul uh, went through a life of stonings, of shipwrecks, of, you know, uh, times of want, he also had times of, uh, you know, where God blessed him. But uh, when you look through Acts chapter 19, the reason why that the people of Ephesus responded negatively to him, they wanted to kill him, was because he was coming against their culture. He was coming against their politics. And he was even coming against their religion with Jesus Christ and the one that he knew. You know, it amazes me, you know, um, you guys know I, I've, I've done my military service, I've, ser I've served in public service, you know, I'm patriotic, I love this country, this country has, you know, been a blessing to a lot of folks, to the world. Um, but, you know, the answer to the brokenness that's, I mean, it, it, I, it, to me I'm blown away by how quick our country is folding. How, you know, it's just like every day there's some kind of, some new news about just something crazy that's happening out there and, and everybody, and, and, and there's a part of me that gets frustrated, even with some folks in my, or friends of mine that are, are leaders in the church that are consumed by the presidential race right now. Like somehow that's the answer to problems, sin, I mean, life, what? I mean, what is, Paul doesn't even bring that up in Acts 19. He just presents Christ to them, knowing that Jesus is the only one, and he's the only answer that we have to change lives. And so as I, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about my, the, the brokenness in my own life, like the apathy in my own life, the, like the laziness that I can find myself uh, um, sliding into many times in my own life, my own walk with him. Um, it's because I've allowed the culture to dictate how I live my life for Christ. I get consumed by the politics. You know, and I'm not thinking of anybody when I say these things, but there was a part of me as I reviewed my Christian walk, like, you know, I've known the Lord now for over eight, about 18 years or so, and so my, when my kids were little, they were engaged in things. You know, I was engaged in things. I needed to always do stuff, but it was all cultural things, and at the end of the day, what happened was that my relationship with the Lord was damaged. Because I had time, and the reason why I'm saying this, I'm just going to be honest with you guys, uh, those five or six days that I spent in Tampa, I can't really chalk up anything that I did spiritual. I'm just being honest. We enjoyed uh, uh, that area. Uh, we enjoyed uh, the sun, even though it was pretty hot. We enjoyed different, you know, food, uh, restaurants. We were going out. We were having a good time. Uh, but, I, but as I, and, and the Lord convicted me last week, uh, when I got up in the mornings, uh, you know, my, uh, my goal, my focus for that morning was to find a Dunkin' Donuts in the area. You know, my wife's looking at me like, we're, we're like kind of on a mini vacation here, but there I am Googling, and like, where's this located in reference to the motel? And, you know, and that was my focus, but I never got up like I do when I'm home, you know, like I normally do, 5, 15, 5, 30 in the morning, and I, get, and I go out and I begin to just pray. And, and so I took this break away from my relationship with the Lord, and the Lord is like, you're a cultural Christian. And I got smoked this past week. And so as I was praying about all this and thinking about, you know, just my own walk with him, um, uh, some of you guys uh, that were with, the, uh, with us at the sidewalk days last um, year, uh, we got, our, the, our churches, we got a little um, section there on the one corner, and right around the corner uh, was another church in, the, in Greencastle, a small church, kind of a, a newer type of a church. They've been here for a couple of years, but um, they were around. We kind of developed a relationship with them, and um, mainly because they were frying some really good fish. But, um, so we were going over there getting fish sandwiches and just talking, and, and we, I, we developed a relationship with a couple of the folks there. And so uh, we had a, a, a good time while we were there with them. And so we, I haven't thought much about them um, since that time last year. And so... Um, Maybe the beginning of last week, there was a message on the answering machine uh, from this lady named Mary Denise 
um, that was from that church, and she said, hey, I remember you know, meeting me and, and Jim and, and some other guys that were out there, and that they were interested in a, uh, starting either a food pantry or they had one going or something and just kind of wanted to see you know, how we do ours. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting, just out of almost a year's gone by, and, and uh, this is the first time we've kind of talked to them. And, and they were really great people, just real nice folks, and loved the Lord. And, and so uh, I, I would go by this church in Greencastle a couple times last week, um, in my the routes that I drive and the times that I just kind of pray and do my thing, but um, and there was nobody at the church or whatever. So Friday morning, as I go by, um, there was cars there about seven fifteen, seven ten, seven fifteen. So I see some cars there, and I just feel like the Lord says you need to stop. Like th- th- this is the, this is the time when He was really speaking to me. I really wanted to just drive by because um, Friday mornings is, is a morning that I like to go to the gym and just kind of, you know, do my exercise thing and just whatever. And, and so I was kind of like arguing with God, don't you know that, you know, exercise does profit a little. And, you know, and he's like, yeah, but godliness profiteth more in this life and in life to come. And I'm, you know, I'm like, man, he's like, okay. So I pulled into the parking lot and, uh, and there's a lady walking towards the front door. And, and um, you know, I'm, in, I'm pretty ragged out in sweats. I look like I'm going to the gym. And uh, she kind of looks at me, kind of almost concerned. And uh, so I introduced myself, and then I think she kind of remembered Calvary Bible Church. Um, and so I asked for this Mary Denise, and she said, well, her husband's car is across the parking lot. She's probably in here. We have prayer. I said, okay, that's cool. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I just wanted to talk to her about food pantry. If she's busy, that's fine. You know, um, I can give her my number or whatever. But she goes, no, hold on. So she goes in, and so Mary Denise comes out, and, and uh, Jim would know her if, if, uh, you know, if, if he saw her. Uh, she was the main lady over there. Was just, she's just a really good lady. <clears throat> and so uh, I began to talk to her, and she talked just real b- briefly about her interest in our food pantry and stuff. And, and she said, well, we meet, on, we meet every day for prayer in the morning, every day. I said, well, that's pretty spirit. I mean, I mean I'm thinking craziness in my head, you know, like, and the whole time, God's, like, orchestrating this meeting with her. And uh, she said, well, how about we talk about this later? And, and she said, but you're more than willing to come in. And she said, we started about 10 or 15 minutes ago, and, and you're more than welcome to come in with us. We have a number of folks that meet here, um, you know, every day in the morning from 7 to 8 to pray. And I thought, you know, i got to go to the gym. I got all, And God is, like, the whole time, like, are you kidding me, like, you found him the one time, and, and you know you, you found this one lady, and this is the one thing that I've been talking to you about for a long time. And so finally, I said, well, and I was still trying to make excuses. I was like, well, you know, I'm dressed in gym clothes. And, you know, I, and she said, well, you're fine. Come on in. I mean, God wasn't letting me out of this. So, uh, so I go into the church, and uh, they don't know me. They're all looking at me. A couple of the guys are sitting in. They have, like, uh, it's a remodeled building. They, they've remodeled. It's real nice inside, but whatever. So they uh, have pews. The guy, guys are looking at me like, who in the world is this guy? Um, so they're already in prayer. So as I enter the building, I can hear them already praying. <clears throat> but what they were praying was not like my prayers. They weren't just, you know, just real quick throwing things up. And I was like, well, this, this is kind of interesting. So I said, you know, so I worked my way up and I sat down and just in, in a pew they had there. And, and so I stayed there till a little after 8 o'clock. And I sat there and I, I wept probably most of the time. Because what God was speaking to me was, is that you don't pray like this, ever. And as I was listening to their prayers, and the reason why I started with 2 Peter 1, because Peter tells us uh, that as long as he was alive, that he wanted to remind those Christians of the things that are so important in their walk with the Lord, that, that is so important uh, in their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and then as I was thinking about that, um, I'm thinking about Nehemiah chapter 1. We've already been in that so many times already. Most of us, I'm sure, are familiar with Daniel 9, or just looking at some of the prayers of Daniel. And I was convicted as I sat here in these pews listening to these people pray, and I can't, and they were praying out loud, which was, who does that? I don't do that, really. I mean, me and Jim and Stephen or Rick or some of us sometimes get together in our, in our groups and we take turns praying for a minute, maybe two minutes. <clears throat> but they sat there for, they were already 15, 20 minutes into it when I got in there, and we sat there for another 45 minutes. And they all were praying. 
And so as I was sitting there just broken in my spirit, as God was saying, if, if he, he was, this is what he was saying to me. He says, if, if Calvary Bible Church wants to be used, he's, uh, you guys are going to have to be about prayer. It's neat that you have all the things, uh, and he wasn't, you know, we've, we've been doing some good stuff here, kind of going back into discipleship. We've, we've um, implemented this learning and living model, you know, learning God's word and then, then motive, trying to motivate one another to live it out. Those are, that's good stuff. But he says, if you don't pray, if you don't seek my face, you're going to have no power in what you do. And so I'm sitting here listening to these people pray, and this is what they're praying. They weren't asking for anything. They were praying, and as they were praying, and I've brought this up a couple times, you know, in Luke 18, where Jesus tells the story of the publican, the tax collector, the sinner, and the Pharisee, that goes into the temple to pray. So as they're praying, as I'm listening to the words of their heart, because I was really listening to their heart being poured out before the Lord, um, my mind is racing through that section in Luke 18 where Jesus tells that story uh, where the religious man goes, the Pharisee goes into the temple, and it says it prays thus with himself, look at me, I'm religious. Look, look at all the things that I do for you, God. I'm not, I'm not a sinner like this guy over here. And then Jesus turns that story and says, this publican, this sinner, was aware of his condition before a holy God. He was aware of his condition as he stood before the Lord. And it says he couldn't even lift his eyes towards heaven. It said he beat his chest and he cried out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. He was broken. And Jesus says, that man went home justified, and the other didn't. See, the religious man missed relationship. He missed um, that, that we talked about in Isaiah 66 and verse 2, that idea of, of being broken and contrite before God. and tre you know, We tremble at his word. And that section says, this is the one that I look at. Remember, we talked about that. This, what that means is, in, that, in the Hebrew means, this is the one as I'm scanning the earth, as I'm looking over all of humanity, the one that stops my gaze, the one that stops me, and, and I look at that one. He said, it is the one who's broken before me, who trembles at my word. And that's exactly what I saw in about six or seven people in that church. They were saying things like, Lord, have mercy on me. That's why I was thinking of Luke 18. Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me. Lord, do a work in my life. Lord, reveal. I mean, they were pouring their heart. There was tears. There, I mean, there was crying out in a way that I, you know, I haven't heard that in a long, long time, and especially in my own life. You know, I have, um, I have four brothers. Uh, three of them are married. With, with kids, some with grandkids. I have four brothers and their family that do not know the Lord. I have other family that I love that does not know Christ. I have close friends um, that, I've that I've developed and all I've done in my life over the years that do not know Jesus, and I do not cry out for them like that church, those five or six people were doing, and they were naming names. I mean, for me, it's like, and this has nothing to do with you guys. This is me. Like, I was thinking to myself, do I care about Mike? Do I care about Steve? Does Micah or Paul concern me at all? I mean, if they were to die in the next minute, they're going to stand before the great white throne judgment, and they're going to have to give an account for themselves. And when the books are open, their names won't be there. Do I care about them? Or do I just pray and I go about my, my duties here. I you know what you know I check off the list of church stuff, and there's just no power. There's no like moving. And so as I'm as I'm wrangling through all this in my life, um, Friday Trace and I were here in the church, and so I'm sitting in the back room there, and and uh, just kind of I'm thinking through all of this. So so Friday morning I, I I'm here with this church, um, where they just really God just He showed me what it means to be a people of prayer. Just He showed me in front of my face. And he showed me where I'm lacking, where, where I don't, I don't, I'm not engaged in that kind of stuff. And so the rest of the day is going, and, and, and I'm praying, and, and just in, in, in the Bible, you know, reading, and just my mind's racing all over the place. And so we decided to come here, and, like, and so I'm, I'm trying to put together a message for Sunday morning, blank. 
it's like, okay, well, God usually shows up late with me, and he always has, so it's like, he'll, you know, and so normally I'm putting, I'm kind of fine-tuning things by Saturday. Um, so, fr but Friday I was stressed because I really didn't have anything. <clears throat> and then just he whispers. I mean, like Stephen's talked about, sometimes it's just that, it's like Elijah. He whispers he, that small, still small voice into my, into my heart, into my soul, into my mind. Why won't you pray? Why are you avoiding prayer? And I'm like, <clears throat> okay, God. If you want me to pray, if, this, if what you've given me as a model, and what are these people that are seeking you as a model for how my life needs to be before you, how I need to model that before Calvary Bible Church, and that's fine. So then I stand up and I go through the office and I start looking for books on prayer. Ian Bounds, Andrew Murray, George Mueller. Where's the great Spurgeon's work at? Where, you know, I picked up even John MacArthur. What's, you know, my, his study Bible has got a section on prayer. And as I was, ran, I couldn't find, my Ian Bounds is back there somewhere. And if, he, if you know the guy, he was a man of prayer. He wrote, most of his work that he wrote was on prayer, but he was for real, and I, you know, I'm not. So it's like, well, maybe I can find a, some kind of a formula or mystery in his book. And, but I couldn't find the book, which was weird because it's back there. <clears throat> and God says, like, why are you trying to find books? I just asked you to pray. I'm like, okay, God, you know, like, that's actually what actually when I went to John MacArthur. I said, well, I won't go to the books. My MacArthur study Bible is over here, and I know that his section, you know, it's, it's, it's categorized from A to Z, and I went to P and found prayer, and oh my goodness, list after just stuff, and my mind was all over the place. I'm like, where do I begin with this? And God's just like, pray. You just need to pray. And so I was fighting with this all day on Friday. I finally just had enough. I came out, and I said, hey, let's just go home. This is nothing's happening, like, you know, I'm just, and Trace kind of knew I was in this quandary or whatever. So this then starts happening to me. And I apologize for you visitors that are here, this is, I'm just on a soapbox. But sometimes, you know, I just don't see church as I study the book of Acts, when I look at Paul in Acts 19, when I look at the church, I just see them being real. I just see them talking to each other, I see them encouraging each other, I see them trying to motivate each other. The, the, the church in America, if we're honest, is really broke. Not all of them. But a majority of them just simply are checking boxes off. Hey, I do my Sunday thing. I, I believe in God, and I'm a good person. And I've been part of that. I'm, I'm at fault for that. So, it's, so I, I, I take responsibility. So here starts God. Tracy, I think she finally got, I don't know, she, she, I think, well, actually, I was telling Jim, she got mad at me. She said, why won't you listen? So, you know, wives are always good for that. <clears throat> Uh, and most of you guys, I mean, you, you met Clark Robinson for the one, for you guys that don't know him. He was here last Sunday with Kyle, and he's been here and taught about a 12-week class on the topic of dying to self, which obviously I was not listening to. Um, so he starts on Facebook, and that is really the only social media that I can figure out, so um, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry if I bring it up. So he starts on Facebook when I'm at, at, at just at my wit's end. I'm just wrestling. I'm like, you know, God, what are you doing, even though I know what you're telling me? So here goes Clark. And Clark is just going, what he does is he writes commentary, uh, he writes his thoughts on books, so he's, in the, he's in, in the Gospel of Luke right now, and so he goes through, he's just chapter by chapter, but he doesn't go verse by verse, he kind of highlights verses, and so uh, he's in Luke chapter 12, uh, there on Friday, and I finally read his commentary, um, and, and uh, so Luke chapter 12, verse 1 is, 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 the, is, the, is the verse context, and so this is what Clark has to say, so they're always really short, but usually right to the heart. He says, never allow your Christianity to be something you wear on the outside while you are empty on the inside. Others can tell when you are pretending to be okay, for your spirit speaks much louder than your words. How much better to be open with your brothers and sisters and draw upon their prayer power in being, or to bring a healing into your soul. Um, and then he quotes James chapter 5 and verse 16, where James tells us that we are to confess our sins to one another, that we might be healed. I'm like, okay, God. Now I find Ian Bounds. And I posted this on the church's Facebook page yesterday. So I find Ian Bounds, and I've, I think I probably have posted this quote before, but it hit me differently after everything I've gone through for, for three or four years, the whole week, my whole laziness during Tampa, um, uh, um, spending time with that church for a little bit. And then God just keeps speaking to me, just right into my, into my spirit. So, so Ian Bounds then tells me, it comes right after, on social media, it comes right after reading Clark. He says, the Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, uh, but through men. He does not uh, come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, uh, but men, men of prayer. 
So I got my Ian Bounds out of the way. Tucked that away. Leonard Ravenhill, so I'm reading him. No man is greater than his prayer life. Ah. So here I am. Now I'm, I mean, Stephen knows all the guys I read. So then I'm back in Tozer. I'm looking for like somebody to tell me, you know, like release me from whatever this craziness I'm in. So then now, now I'm reading Tozer, and, it's, and then so it's, he says, it is dangerous to be so busy that we have no time to wait on God. Like, all right. What else do you got to say, Tozer? And this is the one that, for me, motivated me, because as I was sitting back in that office on Friday, um, I was just kind of going through a book that's called Consuming Fire. I've always had an interest in revivals um, in the church, you know, how God works in revivals, how awakenings happen. Um, so um, it's a gentleman named Brian Broderson uh, wrote this book. It's a real short book. It's easy to read. That's why I like it. It's, so he kind of highlights, you know, what does revival look like? He asked the question, you know, will America have spiritual revival? You know, he doesn't know. Um, he's not so much concerned about that than he is concerned about having revival in the church with individual lives in Christ. And so as I was reading through that book, uh, the last couple chapters actually highlights some revivals. And if you're familiar with, you know, the first or second, third uh, uh, great awakenings of America, um, revivals and works of God, you know, in Wales and in Scotland and Europe, uh, you know, 100, 150, 200 years ago. Um, you know, as I was reading through that, uh, God... Uh, and then I kind of turned and was looking out that back window towards the property, and I was just praying. I'm like, like Lord, why can't you do that in Greencastle? Why, why can't you? Why can't the Greencastle, Mercersburg area, like, like, how can we get out of this 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 environment of church and religion, and, and see you work in the way that I'm reading how you've worked in the past? And He spoke so clearly to me, and it says it just takes a couple people. <clears throat> And I was like, that's exactly what I read. So as I'm reading this account of this one revival that happened in Scotland, it was four country boys <laughs> that got tired of church back in, you know, a long time ago. They began to meet every day, and they began to pray, four guys. And they began to cry out to God the same way that I heard this church, these church people in Greencastle crying out to God, saying those same kind of things. And, uh, and, and, and they weren't asking for national revival. They weren't asking for really, I don't even think, for the church to be healed. They were crying out for themselves. They were confessing sin to the, uh, their sins to God. They were repentant before God. They weren't asking for anything other than that they might know Christ in a deeper way. And then as you read that story, this one revival that I was reading, uh, from there, those four men, it turned into eight men, then it turned into 15 men and women. I mean, just families. And before it was all said and done, there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that were meeting for prayer. Not for church, they were just meeting for prayer. And God honored their hearts. God honored uh, the brokenness that they had before him and swept down through that country. See, when I'm not a big fan of revival meetings. I've been to many of them. I've been to some good ones, and I've been to some crazy ones. <clears throat> they start on Sunday, usually end by Wednesday. They're every night for about two hours, and you get all worked up, and then by Saturday you're back into your old way, and you're doing your own thing, and... And so as I was re think, reading through this book, Consuming Fire, as I was reading um, this quote that really got me, and I'm just going to read it real quick, um, from Tozer. Um, to basically what Tozer is saying here, revival um, isn't really for um, America. The awakening is. <clears throat> but revival is for us individually in the church, me, you, individually. Like those four guys that met. Like when Nehemiah heard the condition of the walls of Jerusalem, when Daniel realized the brokenness even in his own life, he knelt down and he wept. And he cried out before God. And we talked about that when we briefly went through that prayer. You know, if you look in Nehemiah chapter 1 and then you compare it to the first verse of chapter 2, it says that Nehemiah spent approximately four months fasting, praying, Remember it said he got weak in the knees? What that, what that means is he was so broken about his own condition. And we looked at you know, his prayer. And we're, gonna, we're just going to read over that real quick. I gave you, you know, Nehemiah uh, chapter 1 there. Um, I think around about verses 4 through 11 and then uh, Daniel 9. And you look at some of these great men that were just, you know, God answered prayer. And so as I'm reading Tozer, as I'm thinking about these guys, how I'm thinking about my life does not line up like that at all. <clears throat> I'm reading about consuming fire, some of the revivals of these four guys that led into all kinds of 
you know, God just doing powerful things. It eventually brought an awakening to the country. Um, see, I'm not so concerned about our country, even though I'm patriotic. I, you know, just, um, you know, I'm not against the things of our country. And we're, to, we're to pray for our rulers that we might live lives of peace. But I'm, I'm concerned about me. I'm concerned about you. Because and some of the talks from the leadership here has is, is that one day each of us are going to stand before him and give an account for our lives. We're going to give an account you know, to the one who obviously loves us. There's great grace in that. Um, but we all have a level of responsibility. I have a level of responsibility uh, to myself, to my wife, to my kids, to those four brothers that I know do not know Christ. But I can't think of any time I've ever shed a tear before those four guys. Spurgeon, and I'm just going to paraphrase him, one time said, if sinners be damned, if, they, if they're going to go to hell, let them go to hell with our arms wrapped around their knees. If they're going to go to hell, let them go with our dry tears on them. If they must go to hell, let them go, but let them go where, they're not, where they've been warned by us. But I, I, don't, I don't say anything to my brothers. I just, well, my life will speak loud. No, well, no, it doesn't. Because as I've been evaluating my life, I'm like, you know, well, does my life speak anything to anybody? You know, as I'm looking at this, as I'm looking at these four guys that started a revival in Scotland, as I'm looking at this, the ministry. So this is what Tozer says for us. I, I, think, that, I think that if we want Calvary Bible Church, I mean, we've, you guys have gone, um, you guys went through a lot of things that I have not experienced um, you know, I've, I've got cards from you. I've got letters from you. I've, heard, I've had people talk to me um, from, you know, from your past. For you that have been here for years over the things that you guys have gone through, um, I can, I mean, I under, kind of understand, I guess, but I never experienced those things. Um, but God has chosen to keep us alive, moving forward. And the thing that he's been showing me is that he wants to do something powerful in our lives, but he also wants to do something powerful in lives of many people. It's not about, I mean, I, please don't get me wrong. It's not about us going out and witnessing and, and sharing, because we're to do that. But I think that when we come before him broken in the way that Nehemiah wept and fasted for many days, it says, and he confessed the sin, his sins and the sins of, of the country, the sins of his family. When Daniel, chapter 9, he's, he's opening up the Scripture and he's studying God's Word and he begins to see the things that God wants to do in the life of his people, and it says, Daniel began to weep and cry and mourn for his people, confessing his sins, confessing the, his family's sins, confessing the sins of the nation for putting them in the situation that they were in in captivity. And when I studied Daniel and Nehemiah's life, they were good guys. If you read Daniel chapter 1, God blessed him. God used him powerfully to do all kinds of things. There's all kinds of prophetic things that have been given to us through, through Daniel. But then in chapter 9, I'm a sinner, he says. I'm, in comparison to you, when I hold my standards up to you, when I look at you, the standards are that you are holy. And I am undone, as Isaiah said in 6, chapter of, his, of that book. So if revival is going to happen, and I want, so, so I'm reading this book on Friday, I'm, I'm going through this consuming fire, and my mind's going a thousand miles an hour, and I look out across this field, and I remember saying that, it's like, Lord, why, why, can't, why can't you do this here? And he told me, it's clear, I mean, just right into me, he said, you know what, I, I want to do so much in and through Calvary Bible Church, but you guys won't pray. You, got, you guys aren't asking. There's a reason why Jesus says to ask, seek, and knock. Ask, seek, and knock. Continue to ask. Continue to seek. Continue to be broken before him. That church in Greencastle has been doing this Monday through Friday from 7 to 8 for over two years. <clears throat> and so as I leave that service, the pastor, I was speaking uh, to uh, the pastor there, and introduced myself to her, and she was just, you could tell she was tired. She, she was, she, I could hear her uh, you know, pouring her, her heart out, and I said her, so don't, we're not going to get on to the old theology about all that, but <clears throat> and she said, you know, I ma we mailed um, letters out to all the churches in the Greencastle Mercersburg area and said that we have this this desire to just spend some time and pray to pray, and nobody responded. I, I got one of those letters, and I, if I remember, I kind of most, I think I just kind of read it and just threw it away. 
<clears throat> so I'm thinking, as, she's t as she told me this, and, and so Tozer writes, and this is what really got me um, Saturday night, for me, for me personally. Um, Tozer says, the man that will have God's best becomes at once the object of the personal attention of his Holy Spirit. Uh, such a man will not be required to wait for the rest of the church to come alive. He will not be uh, penalized for the failures of his fellow Christians, nor um, be asked to forego the blessings uh, till his sleepy brethren catch up. God deals with the individual heart as exclusively as it only as the only one uh, that is exi that is existing. If this should seem to be an un a duly individualistic approach um, to revival, let it be remembered that religion is personal before it um, can become social. Every prophet, um, every reformer, every revivalist had to meet God alone before he could help the multitudes. The great leader who went on uh, to turn thousands to Christ um, had to begin with God and, and their own soul the plain Christian of the day has much experience personal revival because before he can um, hope to bring renewal and spiritual life into his church, he has to have it in himself. And so as I'm thinking about this, I'm like, you know, am I even worthy to follow? I don't pray like that. <clears throat> So as I was talking to Trace, and we're, we're not going to get into, you know, I would really encourage you guys to read back through that prayer that I uh, skirted over so quickly in Nehemiah chapter 1, I think 4 through 11, whatever, whatever those, ver those, content, those verses. And just take time as you go through that. And as you're going through that, remember that Nehemiah was a godly man <clears throat> as he's saying these things. Go to Daniel chapter 9 and look through Daniel's prayer. And then be honest with yourself before God and say, you know, do I have that kind of communion with you? Do I care about anybody? Do I care about anybody in my family the way you do? Do I care about, do I love truly those folks, my friends, those people that you might put me into contact with day by day? Do I love them to such a degree that I'm willing to, uh, to be broken before you to cry before you. Paul says in Acts 20 that for three years I did not cease with tears in my eyes for you. If you read every book, as Paul writes, the writers of the New Testament, when they start out, I, I, I pray for you. Every remembrance of you, I pray for you. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. Romans 12, 12 tells us to be constant in prayer. I mean, what does it mean to be constant in prayer? It means to be constant in prayer. You know, and, I, and I'm not like that. And so as I was thinking about this, as I was talking uh, to Tracy, um, as I was uh, even talking to my, my kids about this, actually Rachel was concerned, and it's not a dig on her at all, because she's like, what's going on, Dad? What's wrong with you? Oh, nothing's wrong. Everything's good. <clears throat> so, so what I'm thinking here is this is what God has been sharing with me uh, for um, uh, the, the year that I've been here. Um, for specifically this past week and really on Friday going into Saturday, uh, but also for, uh, for many years in my own, my own walk with him, is that um, you know, he's looking for a church that is without spot and without blemish. He's, he's looking for a church that is holy. He's looking for a church uh, that is about the things we've been talking about, discipleship and you know, growing as disciples, learning the word but living it out. You know, we're just real with people. Um, and then we uh, rend our hearts before him, you know, as Isaiah 66 says, we come before him broken, realizing our condition, and then God starts sending the people in. Because then I think he can trust us, I think he can work through us now, because it no longer is about religion. It's no longer about checking the boxes off of church that's so broken this country. And that's the reason, like I've already said, this country is a mess, because the church is a mess. Culture and politics have dictated how the church goes instead of how the church have, having an influence on our culture and our politics. We look more and more like our culture and our political environment day by day. And that's why there's no power in our lives, you see. And so so this, is, this is what I've come up with. This is what I believe God has asked me to do. So I'm reading Tozer. He says, it starts with the individual life. 
It starts with me. It doesn't start with you guys. It starts with me. This is what I think I'm going to do. I'm not a big fan of um, coming up with like magic, magic formulas, um, to, that, you know, thinking that we can somehow um, coax the Holy Spirit into doing anything in our lives. Um, I, I'm really sincere about this. Um, I think that uh, for us as Calvary Bible Church in the season that we're going into as we approach summer um, is that um, you know, we're going to continue in discipleship. We're going to continue in this learning and living we, we do. I, we, I think it's so important that, that we just we do that for real. Um, but if we don't do it um, and, and be known as a people of prayer, when Paul writes to the church in Rome, in Rome cha or Romans chapter 1, he says, he says your, your faith is being spoke about in all the world. I want Calvary Bible Church's relationship with Jesus to be spoke about in this environment that we live in. And I want, it be, I want it to be for real. I want this to be a safe place where people can come in with broken lives and we can touch them. Because we've already been touched by God. And so this is what, this is what, I'm, this is what I'm putting together. And it's, you guys can join me if you want. Monday through Friday, I'm going to be here um, from 7 to 8 in the morning. And I'm just going to pray. I'm glad Tracy's, you know, she works in the school. And so she's going to be off. And so we talked about this uh, last Friday, Saturday, and then again this morning. Me and her are going to be here from 7 to 8, just a simple hour, <clears throat> and we're going to really pray. And it might be without words. It might be just simply with some tears. If you want to come, I, I want you here. We're going to start tonight. I was telling Jim the story. I was trying to put together the lesson for our men's group tonight. You know, we separate the first Sunday of the month, men and women. And God's like, that's good stuff. But why don't you start tonight? And I was like, well, I'll start on Monday. He, he blocked my computer up. <clears throat> so I couldn't put anything together. And I said, okay, I get, I get it now. Finally, I'm really knuckleheaded. Um, so tonight we're going to meet here. Um, the youth are going to minister to the kids. And for us, if you want to come, the adults... Um, I hope everybody that's normally coming for this is going to show up. We're going to spend a time maybe just in a really quick devotion. Maybe if, there's, if God is sharing something in your life, uh, that he's doing something powerful in your life, uh, we can spend a short time maybe just sharing. The Bible says that we're to encourage one another, we're to stir up love and good works, you know, because uh, we see that day approaching. Christ is going to come back. That's serious. That's big. That's serious. And then we're going to spend some time in prayer. We're going to spend some time calling out on God. We're going to spend some time, if, if God leads you to, to maybe confession, maybe there's some things you know, in your life that need to be confessed. The Bible says we're to confess our sins one to another that we might be healed. And I'm going to kind of close with this. I get this message, text message. God must be good because I can really see my phone. Normally I can't read with my crazy eyes. but So I get a text me message on, um, actually it was yet yesterday about 11 o'clock in the morning from someone. <clears throat> just everything is just confirmed. God's confirmed everything for me. This is what it says. So you guys that have been here for a, a time, just take this with it, you know, just take it. Just listen to what, I, what it says. So I get a text message. Because in the course of this, this time period, I'm, I'm praying, I'm seeking God, I'm, you know, what is it you want me to do? What kind of, how do you want me to pray? You know, I just don't want to mimic somebody, some church. I just, you know, I, I see these, revi I just want to try to put formulas together to make something happen. And he's like, no, he's, that's what I want you, I've, show, I've given you a pattern, I've shown you what, what I'm asking you to do is just, uh, you need to pray. So I get this text, and this is what the text says. Do you think there should be a time of prayer for the church to repent of the sins that have occurred there. The people who have been hurt there. The misrepresentation of who he is, who Jesus is, by all the things that have gone on there in the past. That has just come to my mind. <clears throat> Sorry, you know, you know that normally we don't end on just one thing. I get a text, or I get a, I get another message from someone else, completely separate from this person that 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 got a hold of me yesterday. And, and this person says, "I was just listening to this song and thinking about how they how every uh, how every chain needs to be broken in our lives to keep moving forward. Some may be chains of sin and strongholds, but for many, it's chains of fear." 
It's chains of anxiety, chains of worry, chains of even dying or, or about dying to self. It could be chains where there's worry about what God might ask me to give up. And there might be chains of pride that hold us back. <clears throat> I apologize to you visitors that are here this morning. Once again, Calvary Bible Church has gone through a season. And that's all I'm going to say. We're to remember stuff, I think, but only to motivate us to move forward. Um, Nehemiah had done no, he, he done no wrong. Daniel done no wrong. But he confessed his sins in light of who God is. At the core of everything, and Clark has talked about this, at the core of everything is pride. <clears throat> Can we be like that tax collector, that sinner? Can we beat our chest? in light of who God is, and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I, I've, done, I've not done everything perfectly. There may have been some hurt. Matter of fact, I might, I might even be in the right. But God's not about us being in the right as much as he is about us loving our brothers and sisters unconditionally, even when we are right. Jesus was right. And he was crucified. See, when we can get to that place in our lives, <clears throat> when we can be broken like that before God, when we can be broken like that before our brothers and sisters, this place will be full of people that God wants to touch, that he wants to change their lives that he wants to save their souls and make us a real church for him because he's coming back. Because he's coming back. Starting tonight at 6.30, 6.45, we're going to spend about an hour in prayer. <clears throat> I don't have any outline. I don't have anything planned. We're going to start on Monday morning. <clears throat> and I'm going to be here from 7 to 8. Until and in through, I see God working in our lives. And I see people in here that are coming in here that God's bringing and bringing healing to their lives. I have to give an account to him one day. And I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. That's what I want to hear. Let's not be a broken church. Let's be for real. Let's pray. Father, Lord, you've overheard everything. Lord, you know it inside and out, backward and forward. Lord, you know the beginning from the end. Lord, your heart is always towards people. Lord, you, you love people unconditionally for you so loved the world. You so unconditionally loved the very creation that shakes its fist against you, you loved us. Lord, and then you've redeemed us through Christ. Lord, when we come to faith in him, when we, when we acknowledge and confess him as Savior and Lord of our lives, Lord, then you bring us into this awesome body, your body that's been called now to the glory of hope, to the nation, to the people around us, to our family, to our friends, Lord, we have the message of the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are to be ambassadors for you. We are called to be people of prayer. We're, we're, we're called to be people that, that come before you knowing that you want to do a work. I, I know you want to do a work here, Lord. You've clearly showed me that. And, and, and Lord, I, I confess to you this morning, I, I've got in the way, I've been rebellious, I've been disobedient, I, I'm just trying to put together a plan, trying to get, put together something about church, and, and Lord, it's just simply a relationship with you. Lord, help each one of us here this morning grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to the end of that, Lord, help us be about the harvest, for I believe the time is running out. You're asking us to be a faithful church in these days, no matter what comes politically, no matter what comes against us through our culture. 
You're asking us to be faithful, and you always have a remnant of faithful people. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning and challenge us. Lord, bless Calvary Bible Church. Bless each person here this morning, Lord. Guide us in the place that you would have us to go. And I pray that it's to our knees, Lord, as we seek you. Reveal those things in our lives, Lord, that might be a hindrance. Reveal those things in our lives that we've tucked away, thinking no one's seen, but we know you do. Help us to confess them. Help us to repent of things. Lord, that we might be clean vessels useful for the work you want to do in and through our lives. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for, for what, you're, what you've done here, what you're doing here, and what you're going to do here. We ask that your Holy Spirit would revive us and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen.